Delighted to see you here today. Uh, and we're very lucky to have uh, the opportunity to speak to Frank Vigluzzi today because of the tragic events that occurred yesterday in Maine. Frank has been on the air constantly. I'm going to let Dave do formal introductions, uh, but uh, just letting you know he has been in, in the trenches constantly on air, bringing us his incredible analysis about, about the tragic shooting in Maine. So well, we're very, very grateful uh, to be able to hold this event. Um, so I am Claire Finkelstein, as many of you know, the faculty director of the Center for Ethics and the Rule of Law. Um, CERL was founded in 2012 to work on problems of uh, the rule of law and ethics in transnational conflict. Uh, we have been very focused, needless to say, in the past year on the situation in Ukraine and now the situation in, in Israel and Gaza. It certainly is a time that we need to focus on the rule of law and, and ethics in transnational conflict. But some years ago, we, we added democratic governance to what we focus on in addressing rule of law issues. And that brings us to topics that are very close to home. And so today's talk is really about that side of things. Uh, it's about how we address the rule of law and ethical practice in our major institutions here at home. Uh, and I thought that Frank's book, which is absolutely marvelous and it is um, for sale outside, there's going to be um, an opportunity for you to purchase the book, and I think Frank will be willing to sign some copies after the talk uh, and a reception as well. Um, but Frank's book was really a marvelous opportunity for us to address so many of these rule of law issues that uh, we talk about uh, on a regular basis here at Searle, and a particularly excellent opportunity to have our executive director, Dave Johnson, uh, do the, um, play the role of the moderator, although he could well be a speaker himself because of his long experience in the FBI. So let me formally introduce Dave, who will then uh, do formal introductions uh, for Frank. Um, so um, Dave entered on duty as a special agent with the FBI in 1998 and was assigned to the Philadelphia Division's General White Collar Crime Squad where he was the case agent on some of the division's most significant white collar investigations and successful prosecutions. In 2007, he was appointed as a special assistant United States attorney for the Eastern District of Pennsylvania. In 2010, he was promoted to the position of supervisory special agent and associate division counsel. In 2014, Dave was promoted to the position of chief division counsel for the Philadelphia Division of the FBI. Uh, which is the, the FBI's ninth largest office with over 320 agents and 700 total employees. He served as the chief ethics officer for the FBI in Philadelphia and has attained a leadership profession and attained a leadership professional in ethics and compliance certification. Um, so we were really thrilled when Dave agreed to come and serve as the executive director of CERL and we are guided on matters, uh, domestic matters in particular, but um, uh, all matters as uh, Dave gets used to our transnational um, uh, topics uh, and uh, really looking forward to uh, Dave's conversation with Frank Fugluzzi. So let me turn it over to Dave Jones. Thank you so much, Claire. Uh, I am uh, delighted to have you here. FBI's Assistant Director for Counterintelligence after 25 years as a special agent. He held senior leadership positions in major American cities. He has been a national security uh, contributor for NBC News for over five years, where he has appeared on live television over 1,000 times. I think uh, it might be 1,100 now. Uh, exactly. Uh, Hang on one second, Dave. We've got to get you mic'd up. Yep. This is a rare chance to see a one FBI agent interrogating another FBI agent. <laughs> I don't know how that's going to go, but it's a first. I'll be fair. Well, thank you. Um, 
So, and also, Mr. Faguzzi is a best-selling author, as uh, Claire alluded to, with his uh, fantastic book, The FBI Way, um, which was um, on national bestseller lists. Um, Frank also has a, a very large social media presence with over 500,000 Twitter followers. Uh, during Mr. Faguzzi's career, he was named the FBI's chief inspector by then uh, Director Robert Mueller overseeing the most sensitive and complex internal inquiries and audits worldwide, including reviews of lethal force by FBI agents. Previously, uh, Mr. Faguzzi was the head of the Office of Professional Responsibility, where he made disciplinary decisions involving employees to have viol violated FBI policy. Mr. Faguzzi was the head of FBI's Cleveland Division and the second ranking official in uh, FBI's Miami Division, which is the fifth largest office in the FBI. Appointed uh, as an assistant director in 2010, Mr. Faguzzi was based at FBI headquarters in Washington, D.C., and directed all espionage investigations across the United States and the U.S. government. Um, Mr. Faguzzi frequently briefed the White House, Congress, the Attorney General, and has made numerous media appearances. He's a certified intelligence officer under the standards established by the Director of National Intelligence. Uh, Mr. Faguzzi is also a recovering lawyer like me. Um, he earned his JD with honors from the University of Connecticut School of Law and a BA from Fairfield University in New York. He completed Harvard University's National Security Program for Senior Executives in Government. And he holds a certificate of leading strategic change from Northwestern University's Kellogg School of Management. Frank, I'm delighted that you were here. I'm, I'm thrilled uh, that I was invited and that I can be here and that I, I could get away from the tragic uh, news of the last 24 hours, uh, which sadly becomes all too often for me uh, with regard to my media role. And so I've literally been camped out in my hotel room at the study uh, down the street um, where NBC would not let me out uh, of the room. I was on Zoom on my laptop. and. When I tried to plead for mercy and complained that I, I hadn't had anything to eat, they had thought that I would get out of a, at least a half an hour, right, to go get something to eat. I then got a knock on the door where NBC had sent me room service so <laughs> I could eat while I was on the air. So um, it's, a, it's a tragedy that's unfolding. Uh, there'll be lots of time for uh, reflection and much discussion, I hope. Um, as a society about any lessons that are learned here. The news continues to break with regard to um, the situation of mental health and how it relates to this case and the fact that it appears that military reserve superiors are the ones who sent him to um, uh, involuntarily uh, committing him uh, into a mental health facility. It also now appears that his family also told the police that they were concerned about him uh, acting out. Um, so if that's all true, we, we've got yet another discussion to have about what we do to get better at who gets to carry a gun and keep a gun when they've been adjudicated as mentally incompetent. So. Yeah, it's uh, really amazing what's going on in the country. Um, let me ask you this. Why did you write this book? justly be characterized as a management book versus uh, you know, an FBI you know, expose, or even though it's uh, very well written and has a lot of FBI stories intervened, intervened in it, which was really interesting. What made you uh, want to write this book? I, I, I truly felt compelled uh, to write the book. I never thought I would be authoring a book, although <coughs> My, my parents, uh, of course, when I told them I was going, my undergrad major was going to be English literature, they consistently asked me, what are you going to do with that? <laughs> and um, if they were alive, uh, to see the book published, I would have said, see? <laughs> see? Uh, so I, I felt compelled to write the book because it was uh, two years ago, January, <clears throat> and you might recall on January 6th, a couple of years ago, there was something going on in Washington, <clears throat> and that's when my book came out, that week. <clears throat> and I, I had never planned that there would be an insurrection uh, for the release of my book. And the, it's interesting, 
um, you know, when you publish a, a book, you get your, your publisher, mine's Harper Collins, has this whole PR and advertising strategy, hopefully, if you're lucky. And um, they're like, Frank, this is going to be great. Uh, you, you already work with MSNBC, and NBC, they'll, they'll have you on, talk about the book. It's going to really be amazing. Well, of course, all they wanted to talk about with me was what happened on January 6th. Um, so bad news, didn't get a lot of interviews on TV about the book. Good news, talked a lot about what's happening in our democracy and to our democracy. And that's where, to my amazement, the book ended up becoming a national bestseller. Because um, I needed to write it because what I saw happening in the public was the, the public death by a thousand cuts attempts at an institution that I was a part of for 25 years. And I knew that what I was hearing in the public domain was wrong. Not that the FBI is perfect. If, if you think I wrote a book that says the FBI is perfect, oh boy, um, would that be wrong. That's not what it is. But rather, it is that the men and women who come to work every day at the FBI are people who try to protect us. And so I saw the mission of the FBI being eroded. I saw and was hearing back from former colleagues that when they show their credentials at a citizen's doorfront and ask for help on a kidnap or an organized crime case or a terrorism case, and that citizen has to sit there and go, I don't know if I'm going to help you. I, I heard on Fox News or someplace else that you guys can't be trusted, that you're all political, that you're trying to take down a president. And so I said, OK, that, that's enough of that. I'm, I'm going to write a book that says, here's how I experienced the FBI. And it's a, I have to admit, it's a little bit of kind of back, right back at you to those critics of the FBI by saying, not only is it not what you're claiming it is, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go you one better. I'm going to say that the FBI should be studied as an organization that performs at an extremely high level under extremely high stress every single day. And if you're under stress in your team, organization, school, business, you coach a team, you've got issues in your family, and you're wondering, how could an organization function under that life and death stress every single day and mostly get it right? Not always, but mostly. So it's a book about values-based performance. Those of you who study management leadership know that I haven't invented values-based performance. It's been around a long time as a concept. But it turns out that's what the book's about. And I didn't even know I was writing something about values-based performance. The, the real neat thing is when you're a first-time author, as I was, um, when you, your book's out and it's released to bookstores, you kind of sneak into bookstores and, and look where it is on the shelf. <laughs> take a picture of it. Oh, look. You know, maybe you take it off the shelf and you put it front-wise on the, on the shelf. <laughs> well, what I found, the first three times I did that in three different bookstores, it was in three different places in the, in the categories on the shelf. And so one had it under government, one had it under biography, and the other had it under management. So I wrote a book about all of those things, um, simply saying, you can take lessons that I learned from the FBI. Take the war stories, which I call two and three beer stories, uh, because some of them take some time to tell that illustrate each of the chapters in the book, each of the topics and themes. And you can apply them to your own leadership of your team, coach, family, business. I've had CEOs come up to me, and I've presented at corporations. But I've, I've also had parents come up to me. That, that floored me. And they said, you know, we've never discussed that we're based on values. We've never discussed what, what we do or don't do in this family. And I, I, I thought that was very rewarding. Okay. Kind of organize the book by um, seven C's. And the C's are as follows code, conservancy, clarity, compassion, credibility, and consistency. Code is the first one that you reference. And what do you mean by code? I, I deliberately, and yes, it's a shameful trick uh, of memory to, to name each chapter after uh, uh, it starts with the letter C, so you can remember them. But I deliberately started with code for a reason. Code, to me, means the rules you live by, um, an understanding of what you'll do and what you'll never do as a team 
or an organization. You know, if you're talking about a family environment, maybe you're just telling your young children, look, something we're never going to do is we're never going to lie to each other. A nice kind of start to a code. But even organizations I consult with, will uh, I'll walk into a major Fortune 100 company, and I'll see um, a code of ethics on the wall in the reception room, right? You know, our corporate values, here they are, dusty, but in the reception area. But then as I consult with people in the company and I ask them, hey, I saw some code of values in the lobby. Who, who in the company is responsible for enforcing those codes of values? And they'll look at me kind of strangely and they'll go, well, we've got an audit department. I think they do that. Or it might be legal. I think, our, I think general counsel does that. Or HR. I go, that's interesting. Because the concept of code, and we'll get into this in the next chapter, um, really is that this is a team sport, right? We're all responsible for the, for the values of our organization and the brand reputation of the organization. And I talk in the book about how you can start, in, you can start inculcating your code very early in an organization. How do you do that? in the selection and hiring process, because that's where you're a gatekeeper. That's where you decide who comes in. And part of that system should be, is this a person that can actually assimilate our code? Do they have a code of their own that matches ours or close to it? Is there any evidence of values and code that govern their professional career, their, their life? It starts there. I talk about a story you know, in the FBI Academy in Quantico, Virginia first week of your career. And I give the story of, the, of being on the firearms range at the famous FBI Academy. And when you're firing that weapon for the first time, the firearms instructor who's up in a big tower and a loudspeaker, you know, he's using a loudspeaker up in the tower and he says, after you're done with that first round of fire, move forward and score your target. And that's when you realize you're, you're scoring your own target. No, one, no one's coming around and, and not trusting you to, to not cheat on your score. You're counting the holes, you're marking them, and you're telling the instructor, I got an 85, right? That's the first time you realize there's a, there's a code here. The academy instructors will tell you, you'll notice there's no, there's no locks on the lockers in the gym. You won't need them here. You'll have a, an agent, a trainer in your first field office who says, in this office, we can leave a $100 bill on our desk, and it'll be there tomorrow, and it'll be there next week, because we don't steal from each other. So it's that kind of simple application of, of code that starts the book off. Frank, uh, one of the stories or uh, scenarios you talked about had to do with a, a clerk happened with the, the clerk's wife and then the foreign government. Can you kind of tell us more about that? Yeah, so as with any FBI or former FBI employee who writes a book, it has to go through FBI pre-publication review. Um, and you sign that their, your first day in the FBI, right? And you think, yeah, sure, I'm, I'm never going to write a book, you know. And boy, did they take months to go through this book. Uh, but they let, they let a lot into this book. So it's, it's pretty cool how much they allowed me to, to talk about. Well, one of the cases that they allowed me to talk about a little bit was the case of a code clerk who was recruited to work for us. A code clerk in a foreign embassy, at least in our time, Dave, and, and my time in the Bureau, uh, was the number one recruitment target for counterintelligence agents. Now, you might think, if you were asked, if I were to ask you, hey, if you're, you're an FBI counterintelligence agent, who's the most important person in, in, in the foreign embassy or consulate here in America that you're going to want to recruit, value-wise? Who's got the most value inside that embassy? And you might say, well, I guess you'd want to recruit the ambassador. Or, or maybe you'd want to recruit the, the senior military attache. And sure, those would be great. But, but really, you're after the code clerk. So when you say code to a counterintelligence agent, he's not only thinking your values and how you live, but rather he or she's thinking, oh, you mean the guys, the guy with the, the keys. The key is what they call the encryption, the, how you break the encryption on the code ciphers. And that's how that embassy, 
does all their business based on their code. So if you get that guy or gal who's the code clerk, by the way, a relatively low level job in a room that has no windows every day with people watching where you go to eat, limiting your movements, because you, you literally have the keys to the kingdom on their encrypted communications. Well, I tell the story of a code clerk for a foreign nation, an adversary of ours, who was recruited um, out of a diplomatic establishment in the United States. And one day, I get a call as a very young agent in Atlanta, Georgia, um, that there's been a murder in the Atlanta area. And it's the dead person is the wife of this code clerk, who's in, from another city. And I'm told by a very high-ranking official, like the number three guy in the FBI, who's talking to a brand new agent on a secure phone, telling me, Do, have you solved this yet? And I haven't any idea what he's talking about. Um, uh, he tells me, we think we've had an act of terrorism in the United States. We think a hit team came in and killed this woman because her husband was recruited by the FBI. Well, very long story short, you'll have to get the book. Um, the code clerk killed her, killed his wife. And then he made a fatal mistake of his own, which was he called his embassy and said, I'm in big trouble. You got to you got to come find me and get me out of here. Well, they knew he they had they knew that he was playing for Team America. And they were more than happy to find him. And they sent a team to find him. And it was now a race between the FBI to find him and his own country to find him on the streets of America. They got him first. And they took him out of the country, drugged him, put him on a plane at Dulles Airport, and took him out of the country. He's never been heard from since and is likely dead. What's the point of the story? Code's really important, um, number one. But he was trying to have two codes. He was trying to have it both ways. He was trying to play for two teams. And the message there is you really can't play for two teams. You got to choose up who you're playing for. Um, bearing in mind that we're at a law school and this is a CLE event, um, I've been kind of struck by the number of lawyers that have been caught up in uh, January 6th events and then also election denial events and lawsuits with that. Um, you know, multiple of them have been charged uh, and disciplinary actions. And in fact, uh, as of today, who knows, it could change. Three have pled guilty and are cooperating with the state of Georgia. What is your take on that, about why these attorneys who are supposed to be gatekeepers of the law and ethics are co-opting themselves? Well, I'd be eager during the Q&A period to hear what, what some of the lawyers in this room think about this. I, I, and I also think the question is well placed under the chapter we call code, because I think these lawyers, uh, Jenna Ellison and Ches Ken Chesbro, um, and boy, we, we, we could go on and on. Sidney Powell, of course, all of those three have pled guilty in the Georgia RICO case, not to RICO, but to other, other charges, and agreed and essentially confessed that they've committed crimes. Um, Michael Cohen, another Trump attorney, testifying in court in New York in the state AG's case. Um, I can go on and on with lawyers. I mean, we can talk for an hour about Bill Barr, the attorney general, former of the United States. I could talk about John Durham, who was appointed by Bill Barr to investigate the investigators at the FBI. Um, but I, I, fit, I, I fit these lawyers into two categories. One, I think, comes down to code and the lack of a code, a personal code, or they had it and they lost it. And there's been documentaries about Rudy Giuliani. There's another lawyer, right? Boy, how many have we rattled off already? There have been documentaries on literally, I think one was called What Happened to Rudy Giuliani? And you know, we're all scratching our heads there. But, and there, by the way, there's debate on that. People who know him from way back said, no, he never had a code in the first place. He was all about ego and proximity to power and gaining power. And when he lost power, you remember he ran, he ran for president, didn't, didn't get anywhere near winning. His next quest was to stay relevant 
and get proximity to power. Next best thing to power is proximity to power. Well, they used to say uh, in New York, the most dangerous place to be was between Rudy Giuliani and a microphone. Mm. Ego is another factor, right? Yeah, ego, 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 check your ego. Um, that's huge. So that's one category, uh, weak code, lack of code, combined with the ego and, and a quest for relevance. And, and, and by the way, I'll throw into that same category, people who can't get another job. And, and I'm not kidding. If you, if you look at some of these people who Trump surrounded himself with, um, their, their resume is horrible. They, they really would not get a meaningful job elsewhere. And he knows that. He knows that, and that's how he retains some of them. Because the people who can get the good jobs, they leave quickly. I mean, Rex Tillerson was the CEO of ExxonMobil, for heaven's sake. He just wanted to serve the public. He didn't need any money. He didn't need any job. He said, yeah, I'll be Secretary of State. I meet, I meet the heads of state everywhere I travel as the head of ExxonMobil. I can do this. And then he had a cup of coffee at the White House, you know, and said, I'm out. I don't, I don't need this. So, so there's a lot of that. The second category I put these lawyers in um, are true believers. There are, there are true believers. Um, we may have a, a new speaker of the house that's a true believer in the cause. And I, I would put, by the way, John Durham in the true believer category. I, I actually uh, interned when I was in law school for John Durham in Connecticut on the Organized Crime Strike Force. Uh, I have nothing but good things to say about John and my experience there. But he's a true believer. By that I mean there is a religiosity, both literally and figuratively, about how he feels he's on a mission. And he's kind of like the only guy in the room that can save society because he believes society is going down the toilet. And unless we do something about it, it's going, we're going to lose it. And so he's going to fix it. Um, there's a lot of true believers out there as well. Um, Frank, one of your other chapters is uh, titled Clarity. What do you mean by that? And also, if you could kind of loop in the uh, Leon Gonzalez case uh, mm -hmm. that you uh, had experience with when you right. were down in Miami. OK. <clears throat> so we've done code. And um, we're moving on to clarity. Why would I put clarity second in the order of priority for chapters? Because if you've established your code as a team or organization or an individual, the next thing you have to do is not hide it under a bushel. <laughs> you've got to tell your team clearly, that's the clarity part, here's our code. You, you, under, you with me on this? Do, are, are we all together on this? Because so often, um, I'll, I'll consult with a company and I'll say, uh, you have guidelines and, and rules? Oh, yeah, 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 we've got them. Where are they? I, I don't know, I haven't seen them in five years, but we do have them. Um, and everybody kind of knows where to find them. And then I'll, I'll ask employees, do you know where to find the, the corporate guidelines? No, I don't. Okay. Maybe at orientation I got a book. Okay. So the clarity part is about really making sure everybody's on the same sheet of music. In the FBI, you know, simple example, in the FBI's intranet, the internal web in the FBI, it's, it's, you can click on the home page and look up rules. The rules are there, you know, click on them. And um, the other thing is not just the rules are clear, but what happens if you don't follow the rules are also clear with clarity so that no one can claim surprise. I had no idea I would get fired for that. I had no idea that would be a two week suspension without pay. I will tell you, my, my foray into the corporate world after retirement, I learned that some lawyers in corporate settings don't <laughs> like to have clarity. It's a deliberate fog, I call it. Because, Frank, if we have clarity, about what we have to do if the rules aren't followed. We can't make it up on situational cases. You know, every case is different, Frank. Oh, okay. I see. Deliberate fog. I got it. So that's clarity. So, but clarity is not only about knowing what you will do and always, you know, always doing it, 
like I'll give you the, the, you know, the, the so-called bright lines in the FBI, right? Louis Free was a director at one time. He was famous for, for, for clearly stating, uh, hey, if you do this, you're out. And it's tied directly to the mission of the FBI. If you're sitting there wondering, okay, I, I lead a team, I have no idea what you're talking about, about what we would do or never do or what our brand might be. I'll give you the very simple example. Louis Free, when he was director, said, if you lie under oath, you're fired. Now that seems very apparent to you, right? But before Louis Free, that wasn't written down anywhere. And can you get more directly tied to the mission of the FBI that where agents have to testify in court every day around the country, right? Can you get more clear about how, yeah, that is what we do for a living, isn't it? So if you lie under oath, you're fired. You mean even like during an internal investigation about, you know, how the car, the bureau car got in an accident? Yep, you're fired if you lie. Okay. The other thing he did on, you know, lesser example, you know, we, we drive in bureau vehicles, they're government cars, there's strict rules about using your government car and everything. And he, he said, look, um, if, you're, if you're drunk in the government car, first time, 30 days suspension without pay, second time you're fired. It was clear. Things had never been that clear. So you should ask yourself as a leader, do I have clarity? The other thing I, I, I talk about in clarity is it's not only knowing what you will do, it's knowing what you won't do and staying in your lane as a mission. The example I give, there might be some young folks here who don't remember this case, but who remembers the case of little uh, five-year-old Elian Gonzalez, who sadly floated here with his mom from Cuba. The mom drowned. Elian hits the soil of Florida on his own. He's quickly uh, uh, brought into the arms of relatives in Miami, in the Cuban community. And then the national story begins. Because Elian's father, back in Cuba, who was separated from Elian's mom, is saying, I want my kid back. Yeah, that's my kid. I need him back here in Cuba. And boy, is this a soap opera that plays out on our screens every night on the news, right? And the, the vibrant Miami Cuban community has even divided itself we can't let this young boy go back to Castro's Cuba. He'll be raised a communist. We keep him here with his family. Oh, my word. So this falls on the desk of Attorney General at the time, Janet Reno. She has to make the call. Because we say, well, why DOJ? Why? Well, it's an, it's an immigration matter. And Im immigration at the time fell under DOJ. And this takes the wisdom of Solomon, right? My Lord, give the boy back to his father or not. And, and she takes weeks and weeks, and it's getting heated, and, and the vice president and president are weighing in. And you know it becomes political because, oh my, this is the, wait a minute, we're talking about the Cuban community in Miami. They vote. They vote all the time. And so the White House is trying to call the shots. And Janet Reno is going to, no, 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 no. I'm going to make this up on the facts and the law. OK. Long story short. She makes up her mind, and it's Easter weekend. In fact, it's Easter Sunday. I'll never forget, I'm having dinner with my family, Easter Sunday. Of course, I get called into the office. Of course, I do. And I drive in, and you know, I've got the boss there. I'm the number two guy. The head of the office is there. We've got some SWAT people there, and we've got immigration there. And I'm like, oh, no. Oh, no. And, and my boss is on the phone with Janet Reno. So the head of Miami office, you know, and he knows Janet because she's from the Everglades. And we protect her. The FBI protects the Attorney General. She comes home on weekends, and we protect her in her windowless cabin in the Everglades. And he says, uh, Attorney General, and I, I can only hear one side of this conversation. Attorney General, please, this is not the FBI's job to take Elian Gonzalez out of the hands of his relatives and return him to Cuba. That's not our mission. We function here because the Cuban community cooperates with us. We, we do counterintelligence work with them, counterterrorism with them, everything with them. And you're going to destroy us 
if you make us take this boy out of that house. Now that house was ringed, you might recall, was ringed by off-duty Cuban Miami police officers. A lot of them who voluntarily off-duty surrounded that house knowing the federal government was about to do something. So Janet Reno had mercy on us and said, okay, okay, um, I'm gonna have the immigration tactical team do this, who by the way, no offense, not a lot of tactical experience in the immigration service at that time. Um, but we said we'd, we'd back them up, we'd stage nearby if, they, God forbid, they got taken hostage. <laughs> and, um, you know, but please, God, don't let us do this. this what, what, why is this in clarity? The clarity to know what you won't do, because it will undermine you and your mission. So don't, don't, look, don't let mission creep take over, because you'll get hurt by it. Now, the, if I may interject, yeah. I think the photograph of the immigration agent yeah. Pulling the boy out of the closet was on every yeah. front gate. An automatic the weapon in, the world. in this boy's face and the relative's face. Har horrible photo. But I will tell you there's a hero in this story, which is, and boy, you want to talk about clarity of purpose. If you see, check out on the internet and look at the photos of the immigration van as it pulls up to the front of this house. There was a good friend of ours who was the deputy chief of police for the city of Miami. And he was with us that night planning that, that raid at the office. And um, he looked at us when he heard the plan. And he said, let me tell you something. Those officers are my officers that are surrounding that house. Uh, they're all Cuban. And they will not step aside for the federal government. The only person they'll step aside for is me if I order them to step aside. And I'm going to be in the front seat of that van, and they're going to see my, my stars on my, on my shoulders as the deputy chief, and I'm going to order them to step aside. He did it. The next day, of course, the Cuban mayor of Miami fired him and fired the chief of police as well, just for grins. That's clarity of purpose, knowing that you're, you're getting fired, but you got to do the right thing. Frank, one of your uh, topics is uh, consequences. And if you could uh, talk about the uh, AMD case, which I thought was uh, very uh, enlightening on this. Yeah, I, I then chose to follow uh, clarity with consequences. Because look, we've, we've now, we're in the point in the conversation where you're like, OK, I think I'm on board. I, I, I know I've got to have code. I've got to clarify it with the team, get everybody to assimilate. But then comes the unpopular part nobody wants to talk about, which is what happens if a member of the team decides they're not, they're not on that sheet of music anymore and, and doesn't follow the guidelines, the rules, the, the team's values. There's gotta, have, there's gotta be some consequences. There has to be, and it's really unpopular for many leaders. I've encountered that in the FBI, uh, some leaders getting to a point where, yeah, they have to kind of enact some discipline, and they don't want to do it. You mean I'm not going to be one of the guys anymore? I'm not going to be like, nobody's going to like me anymore, <laughs> right? There's got to be consequences. And then, you know, there's also, for lawyers particularly, there are opportunities as a lawyer to observe where the consequences don't match the crime. Whatever kind of law you're practicing, you're going to encounter an op a situation where there's a gap that needs to be addressed, whether it's legislation or lack thereof um, or other policies or procedures. And I encourage you to step up there and lead and fill the gap. The example I give of that, I give a couple of those, but I was the head of an office in Silicon Valley, the Palo Alto resident agency, which answers to San Francisco. It's the only satellite office in the FBI that is dedicated entirely to counterintelligence. That's all it does. No surprise, because it's in Silicon Valley. And because every foreign intelligence service in the world is trying to steal our technology secrets in Silicon Valley. Well, while I was there, one of the employees uh, of Advanced Micro Devices, AMD, uh, who used to work for Intel Corporation, stole the formula to the Pentium chip 
Intel's Pentium chip. And it, you'll remember the, the early days of our computers where you had a little sticker on the screen, powered by Pentium, Pentium chip inside. Yeah. Billions of dollars in market value and future market value of the Pentium chip. This guy walked out the door with a video cassette where he had old fashioned, I kid you not, videotaped on a screen, the formula for cooking, I call it, the Pentium chip. Walked out the door with a cassette. Okay. Um, do you know what law is, was available to us back then to address the theft of a Pentium chip formula worth billions of dollars? Something called, here's the law, that we, and the only law we had, something called ITSP, Interstate Transportation of Stolen Property. It's an old car theft statute. It was designed for car thieves that cross state lines. That's all we had. And, and interestingly, the ITSP statute, you know, if you're trying to figure out sentencing, and you base your, your consequences on the value of what was stolen. Literally, what the value of what was stolen. The value of what was stolen literally was a cassette, a VHS cassette tape, uh, which I think was two dollars and twenty-five cents. <laughs> so um, I get a, I get a call from Louis Fries' office. I'm at my desk, I get a call from the director's office, and he goes, "Hey, I think you have the case to address a gap in consequences. I think it's time to round up the Silicon Valley CEOs." Go to, the, go to Capitol Hill with them and advocate for passage of an economic espionage law. Because we're getting killed on this. And I said, okay, let me see if I got this right. I'm gonna go round up the big name, high profile CEOs in Silicon Valley. I'm gonna tell them to get on a plane with me and go to Congress and reveal publicly that they're all getting destroyed with trade secret theft. And of course, we'll, that will notify their board of their boards that the companies are going under on trade secret theft. Yes. <laughs> oh, okay. So um, rule number one, don't show up in Silicon Valley high tech firms in a suit and wingtips. Don't, don't do that. I, I learned that. I learned that. Uh, I learned that at Intel Corporation, where at the time the CEO sat in a cubicle with all the other employees, except he had a corner cubicle. Long story short, we got um, Zoe Lofgren, was a congresswoman from Silicon Valley. She was on board with me. And we convinced all the CEOs to do it. Sounding, because it was a gap without consequences that the gap needed filling. And we passed, Congress passed the Economic Espionage Act. In fact, it comes in two parts. If you're committing economic espionage for a foreign power, it's 20 years in prison. And if you're just doing it for grins, it's 10 years. Uh, and that's, that's how we got the, the Trade Secrets Act, the Economic Espionage Act. Wow. Um, Frank, real quick, there's another um, vignette from your book that I'd like you to discuss. It's kind of chilling, and it talks about something that was overheard on a foreign uh, that was uh, lawfully authorized, and you captured something that put the FBI into uh, an ethical quandary. Is it so just like clarity has two parts, the one where you're clear on what you will do and you're clear on what you shouldn't do, consequences has two parts as well. It's really easy to do the right thing to avoid consequences, right? Sure. It's much harder to do the right thing despite the consequences you know are coming. Doing the right thing when you know it's going to be painful for you and your team and your organization. That's really hard. The example I give of that in FBI history is, and again, the FBI cleared this for the book to my astonishment. Um, and this is still taught at the FBI Academy, by the way. There was a FISA wiretap, Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, court authorized wiretap. But it wasn't a wiretap, it was a microphone, literally a physical microphone installed in the kitchen of a home in St. Louis, Missouri. It was part of a terrorism, organ a, a, a terrorism investigation 
involving the old, uh, boy, you know, Hamas is in the news these days. This was the old ANO, the Abu Nidal Organization. There was a cell, believe it or not, in St. Louis, under investigation, court-authorized microphone, in the kitchen of this married couple and this family that we knew were in leadership of the cell. Well, these two, guys, these two people, the husband and wife, they weren't operators in terms of bomb throwers, so there was not a live translator listening in real time and translating. That happens when you're dealing with active threats and bomb throwers. This is a timed thing. So a translator comes in the next day, probably not even in St. Louis, probably in Washington. She turns on the recording from last night, and she listens to this couple, this husband and wife, this mom and dad, murder their teenage daughter in the kitchen. This was an honor killing. It was an honor killing. From uh, it, it, this happens in, in Islam, in some circles, still happens today. She had the audacity, this teenage daughter, to date a non-Muslim, and the audacity to get a part-time job to start saving for college, against their will. She was dressing in Western style. This all disgraced the family, and they decided it was time to kill her in the kitchen. And the translator is listening to this. And she clearly understands what she's listening to. Why is this in the consequences chapter of doing what's right even when it's going to bring pain to your organization? It's a classified FISA surveillance of a terrorist cell inside the United States. The FBI has a decision to make. What do we do? We just captured a murder. We have it on tape. It's going to destroy the terrorism investigation. We're done. It's done. This gets exposed in court. Now, I can tell you the FBI spent about five seconds on that discussion because they know what the right thing to do is. This has to go to the police department. It has to get declassified. and has to go to the police department. I can also tell you that in many other nations with many other intelligence services, no way that would have happened. There's no way. They would have said, we're saving, our, we're saving our case, right? They would have found a way to write an anonymous letter to the police department. Hey, uh, you might find a body at this address, right? Or they'd find some, some way to jam up, jam up the two, the mother and, and the father, and say, we're going to tell on you about your murder of your daughter unless you work for us. That's what happens in other countries. But it doesn't happen in this country. Uh, and so it's taught at the academy not only to teach what an honor killing is, but also to teach ethics. Like, hey, this is a no-brainer. Case be damned, someone was murdered, we'll, we'll lose our case for this. That's OK. Yeah, surely. And compassion is another one of your uh, titles of your book here. And, uh, how important is compassion with leadership and within organization management? Yeah, I, I wanted to be really uh, clear that I would follow the consequences chapter, which can sound very severe and draconian, with a chapter called compassion. Because if you're a leader without compassion and you're all about consequences, good luck with that team following you. Because they'll clearly see in a second that this is an unfair situation. I can't get heard. No one takes my circumstances into uh, consideration. And so um, even when I was for a uh, not the most lovely time in my FBI career, I headed up an adjudication unit in the Office of Professional Responsibility. And I, I was the guy who lost sleep at night trying to figure out what to do with a very good FBI employee who's really screwed up. Um, we built it into our, we built compassion into our discipline system by requiring the final brief on a discipline case to have aggravating circumstances and mitigating circumstances. What is it in this employee's life that caused them under severe stress, right? Everybody has a breaking point, everybody, to do this thing. 
compassion has to be in there or you will never get your team to assimilate your values. So I, I talk about, uh, David, I talk about compassion in, in two different ways as examples. One is the example of an agent who worked for me in Cleveland named uh, Lori Fournier. And I don't know if you know this, but here we are, gosh, what is it, 22 years beyond 9-11? You know, people are still dying from 9-11. They are, in large numbers. In fact, we've now surpassed the number of deaths that occurred, what, about 3,000 deaths on 9-11? We've surpassed that number in deaths related to exposure to the crash sites. And you may not know, uh, certainly the Fire Department of New York has surpassed just recently surpassed the number of fire department officers killed on the day. They've now surpassed that number in deaths related to cancer and uh, you name it, asbestos exposure, all traceable scientifically to various toxins from jet fuel and from asbestos in buildings at all, at all sites, by the way, all three sites. Lori Fournier worked for me in Cleveland. She was part of the evidence recovery team. She responded to the crash site in Shanksville, Pennsylvania. She worked there for days. Later in life, she developed cancer, a form of cancer that was traced back to that site, but only because the FBI, upon her death, the FBI later came to her family and said, hey, was Lori at the Shanksville site? Yeah, she was. Would you mind if we looked at her blood work from her treatment? Okay, they didn't have to do that. They could have covered it up, quite frankly. But they said, you know what? Her cancer is from the Shanksville site. And she became someone who was designated as someone who died um, uh, in the line of duty. Um, and she, her family got benefits um, from that. Something that didn't have to happen, but was done out of simple compassion. That's, uh, that's so true that uh, management without compassion will follow you like that. Frank, um, you also talk about credibility as one of your CDs. And then uh, you talked about a case uh, involving um, an Indian national attempting to board an aircraft when you oh, yeah. were a baby agent. Yeah. So look, when you talk about, in the corporate world, they use the phrase brand reputation, right? In the FBI, it's all credibility. It, those credentials that you carry as an agent, you know, I carried them for 25 years. When you display them to the public, if they don't mean something, you're done as a law enforcement organization. You're just done. And so I talk about having credibility as a leader. Now, the chapter on credibility is not, and I'm careful to say, is to have credibility as a leader does not mean you're perfect. People confuse that. Oh, he screws up sometimes. He has no credibility. No, 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 no. What I say is the FBI screws up all the time. Unfortunately, it's on the front page of the paper when they do. Um, credibility is about not perfection, but being passionate about getting it right. If your team knows you're passionate about getting it right and you're transparent, transparent when there's a screw-up and you talk about the screw-up and how you're going to fix it, that gives you credibility. Now, the lesson for me as a young agent on how important credibility was publicly for the FBI um, came, I was, again, I'm in Atlanta, Georgia, because the FBI, in its infinite wisdom, sent this Connecticut Yankee to Atlanta, Georgia for his first assignment. Um, we, real quick. We had a case involving a former finance minister from India, and he's visiting the United States. And while he's here, we didn't even know he was here. Why would we? We get intelligence, solid intel, that a hit team is coming to kill him while he's in the United States. So all of a sudden, we're protecting a former finance minister from India in Atlanta, Georgia. You can't make this stuff up. And um, as it's, it's his time to move to the airport and leave on a flight back home. 
at an Atlanta Hartsfield airport. He's, on a Lufthansa, he's going to be on a Lufthansa flight. So my supervisor says to me, hey, um, before we start moving him toward the airport, you go, we race ahead to the airport, check out the international gate area where he's going to be for his flight, and um, start looking for the people we're supposed to be looking for. Well, the people we're supposed to be looking for, according to this very solid intelligence, are going to be people wearing saffron turbans. Right? So I'm sitting there, you know, I, I'm blue light and siren to Hartsfield Airport. Lord knows where I parked my car. I'm in the international terminal. I'm in the gate area for his flight. And I'm watching people kind of mingle, get to the gate, sit down, check in. I'm like, boss, uh, we're good. There's nobody with saffron turbans here. As soon as I hang up with my boss, here comes saffron turban number one. <laughs> I'm like, oh, uh-oh. And followed by saccharin, uh, saffron uh, turban number two, three, four, and five. Uh, I'm like, uh, boss, we have a problem. He goes, no, you have a problem. <laughs> <laughs> I said, okay. He goes, you, you, can't, you can't have that flight take off. And we're going we're gonna to search. The, we're going to get um, customs, and we're going to search every bag and all of those people. Okay. So again, young agent. I, I go up to the gate, the counter, the gate agent. He's a tall German fellow, because it's Lufthansa. And I say... Um, I, show, I pull out my credentials very discreetly. Uh, FBI, uh, we need to stop this plane from taking off. And he looks down at me and he goes, this plane has never been late, and it won't be late today. <laughs> I'm like, oh, OK. So the credentials, the credibility, no, it's not working. <laughs> so I said, um, look, here, I don't think you understand. Uh, I need to speak to the captain of this aircraft. I will not get the captain out of their cockpit. Okay. He said, then I'm going to go in and get him. Okay, okay, okay. He says, <laughs> so the captain comes out, and I take him aside in the corner of the little gate area. I show him the credentials, and I say, we have a threat against this aircraft. And it can't take off until we search the aircraft. And he looks at me and he goes, you're the boss. That's credibility. Did I personally have credibility? Of course not. It's in the credentials. That's what I'm talking about. That's why I wrote the book. So you have to ask yourself if you, as a leader, have that credibility that comes with you and your brand. Uh, Frank, we're kind of getting towards our time here. Yep. Uh, consistency was uh, one of your C's from your book, and if you could elaborate on that and uh, kind of end on a yeah, yeah. So, so there's good news, I think, here. And, you know, you're always looking for a happy ending in the book, right? I deliberately chose to end the book with uh, the seventh chapter called Consistency, and it's it's human nature. When you're facing something as a leader, as a lawyer, to kind of look at unprecedented events and crises and think that you've never seen this before, and therefore, there's got to be some different way to handle this, right? All the things I've been taught in law school, in my career, um, yeah, they're not going to work because you know what? No one's ever seen this happen. I've heard this, by the way, with the situation our country is in right now, right? We have a twice indicted president facing indictments, excuse me, twice impeached uh, former president facing indictments federally, states. We have a domestic terrorism threat here and hate crimes here. We've had an insurrection at the Capitol trying to overturn a free and fair election. And people come up to me all the time and say, Frank, uh, this has never happened before. What do we do? We can't, we can't possibly just keep on our track here. And I, I give the example for consistency of when I was called as the number two person in the Miami FBI office by a doctor at a West Palm Beach hospital. 
And she said, I'm calling you because we have a man here in the hospital who's dying from anthrax. And I said, uh, oh, I'll be right there. I made it there very quickly. And um, I walk in and there's a, I mean, I, I walk into this room. It's, it's a tight room with a conference table and it's surrounded by doctors. And I walk into the room and they all look up at me like the savior has arrived. And I go, uh, Frank Figaluzzi, FBI. Right? Now, I, I'm an English major who went, who went to law school. And they start briefing me on what they're seeing under the microscope in terms of this guy's blood. And I'm like, hold on a second. And I dial up, the, thank God, the FBI's PhD microbiologist at Quantico. And I put them on speakerphone. And I said, tell them what you just told me. And they, they repeat what they're seeing in terms of rods and what the cellular structure looks like. I go, okay, good. And then I can see I'm being texted by the microbiologists. And they go, God darn, that is anthrax. And I went, oh, okay. So then I became the on-scene commander of the nation's first hazardous materials crime scene where someone had died from anthrax. It was a three-story, 60,000 square foot building of American Media Incorporated in Boca Raton, Florida. The parent company of the... Oh, the, oh, the tabloids, the star and the inquirer. <laughs> yeah, David Pecker, CEO, <laughs> who had a safe with Trump's secrets in it. Oh, I've got stories about that. And um, yeah, so what, why, why is this in the consistency chapter? Because the evidence response team for Miami FBI, a great team, they could have looked at me and said, hey boss, we've never been in an anthrax filled building before, filled with microscopic spores of anthrax that killed the guy. We don't know how to do this. But instead, what we did was we said, look, is this a crime scene? Yes. Uh, is it a fatal crime scene? Yes. Do we do crime scenes really well in the FBI? Yes, we do. Are we hazmat trained? Yes, we're hazmat trained. We, we get in suits and we do hazmat environments. So this is a hazmat crime scene. Yeah, and we can gather evidence. It's microscopic evidence, but that's what we're gonna do. That's what we do anyway. So what? It's anthrax. And we did it. And in no air conditioning in Miami, Florida, in uh, October, uh, these agents went in and out and in and out, looking like floating ghosts in their white Tyvek suits and, and uh, uh, positive air pressure respirators. And uh, on, by the way, all of us on Cipro antibiotics for 30 days, that'll destroy you. And then um, they did it. Here's how I end the book with consistency. When you're faced with something unprecedented that you think you've never seen before, that's the wrong time to abandon the ethics, integrity, and values that got you there in the first place, right? So with regard to the country's plight right now, I remind people, actually, we have been through crises before, civil war assassinations, violent protests. Stick with what got us here, the rule of law, the Constitution, three equal branches of government. Double down on it. Don't abandon it and think we need something new. And eventually, you'll get through it. It's what scientists do when their experiments are going south on them. They double down on sound scientific principle so they can defend the result at the end. And, and if we do that in our lives, our careers, our country, I think it'll work. Outstanding. Well, Frank, I want to be like a Lufthansa employee and end this this part of the portion right on time. So we will we can end this right here. And I'd like to uh, open it up to uh, audience questions. Uh, sir. Thank you very much. I haven't read the book, but I'm wondering, uh, you know, you talk about a really, sounds like a really well-evolved organization with, with your code. And, um, but... I know stories in the past under Hoover and others where maybe the FBI was not so savory. Was there a turning point or a turning point that you might identify, like, like was it the church committee or, or uh, Director Free you had mentioned, where things really seemed to take a turn?
turn for the better. Yeah, I mean, you, so for sure, um, if you were, let's say, to buy a book, you know, somewhere around us, maybe in the next hundred yards, um, yes, you would hear. There you go. You would absolutely read that I do discuss the mistakes uh, throughout the FBI's history. And here's the thing. Yes, the, the, the church committee was absolutely a turning point for the FBI because it, it actually said, wait a minute, you guys don't have guidelines that you operate under? Seriously? Are you, you mean, yeah, we get it's bad that you're wiretapping American citizens without any legal process, but you mean there's no rule that says you have to have legal process? No, yeah, nope, there's no rule. Wow. So it put form and structure and process around the FBI. It created attorney general guidelines, but most importantly, because this could, I remind people, this could happen again. So just because, you know, you think, oh, well, Hoover died, um, the abuses of the past are gone. No, inherently in a domestic security law enforcement organization that can deprive people of their liberty, you, you are asking for trouble just by waking up every day and doing your job. So the, what the church committee did was actually inject oversight, continuous oversight by the DOJ inspector general, uh, internally with the FBI with rigorous inspection and audit processes, and of course, Congress. I mean, they get in the weeds. And I, as assistant director, I was constantly on the Hill briefing, 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 even if I didn't want to be briefing all that, that much. So church committee, absolutely. Um, also, incredibly more transparent FBI these days, much more transparent about processes. So yes, the study of the church committee is important. Um, there's something coming up on, on the FISA renewal process. I know uh, Searle has been a huge player in the discussion around, I don't know if you know this, but the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act expires at the end of this year, particularly Section 702, which allows the American government to collect and keep your conversations when you call a target overseas. So American government listening in on a terrorist or spy overseas. You happen to call Uncle Igor, not knowing. Uncle Igor's a spy. They've got your conversation. They're not redacting your part of the conversation. They're keeping it for later reference. That expires at the end of the year. It's that kind of public discussion and congressional oversight that keeps from over uh, over abuse and excessive uh, exploitation. So I don't know if this is working. Um, uh, Frank, you're, you're uh, lucky it was uh, Dave moderating today because, you know, D Dave and I like to play a good cop, bad cop because I really like to challenge our authors and, and press them on um, you know, on their perspectives a little bit. So let me actually do that for a minute with, with you. Um, and I want to ask you about the Horowitz report uh, about the FBI, which was in, in some ways a very fair-minded report and that it was sort of on the one hand, on the other hand, the FBI, um, you know, the, um, the Russia probe was found to be well predicated, um, Horowitz wrote. And the Carter whole flap about the Carter Page um, uh, surveillance uh, was found to be justified, but it really didn't show the FBI in the kind of light that you're painting it. And it contributed to uh, an unfortunate narrative, the kind of lack of, of trust that you've been talking about, that you wrote the book to address. Um, it didn't, I was actually surprised by it because I had a lot more confidence in the FBI before I read that report than afterwards. Now I know that, that it did cause a certain amount of soul searching and, and some changes, yes. but, but how should we look at the FBI in light of that report and in light of the changes that the department may have put in place after that report? Mm. Yeah, a, a great question because, you know, <laughs> Part of the damage the FBI undergoes is self-inflicted, often. Um, it's a huge, unwieldy organization that covers everything from bank robbery to espionage and everything in between. White-collar crime, 
kidnapping, mortgage fraud, drugs. You can go on and on and on and on. And the size and unwieldy nature of its responsibilities, responsible for over 300 federal violations from the National Refrigerator Act to the Migratory Bird Act, um, right up to- VBL. Pardon me? VBL. What's VBL? <laughs> yes, you cannot interfere with a migrating flock of birds or the FBI will show up. Nor can you transport a, a refrigerator with its, uh, with its door on in interstate commerce. What's my point? They do a lot. And there's, there's a lot of rules. This question feeds right back into this whole concept of code, conservancy, conservancy clarity, because sometimes there are too many rules. And meaning by that, I mean, if you don't have specialists doing very complex things, you're gonna screw up. And shame on the FBI for having folks do things sometimes that they weren't doing last year or even last week, but now they're doing it. So part of what Claire's referring to is, you know, we, we sometimes hand, you know, we certainly handed to Donald Trump failures within the FBI or errors in judgment, even in the case of, of one employee in general counsel, a young attorney in the FBI who pled guilty to um, falsifying a statement in the Carter Page uh, FISA. Mr. Kleinsmith. Yes, thank you for naming the employee. <laughs> uh, oh. Although I can get in the weeds on that too. I'm not going to try to excuse what he did, but I've been where he is. Um, I didn't do what he did, but what he did was try to characterize a CIA explanation of a source and I've been in a room with the CIA trying to explain what their source is and whether he's a real source or just an asset or no he's kind of informal no we haven't paid him but we, well we gave him we gave him yeah he's a pocket source okay look I'm typing an affidavit I have a sentence here that requires me to characterize this guy as a source or not what say you uh, say he's not a source oh, okay <laughs> You just told me he's kind of a source. It gets really strange. But here's the thing. Um, you can't be handing detractors reasons to bash you. And I write in the book about Jim Comey, who is a man of great character. You'd love him as your next door neighbor. You'd have him babysit your kid. You really would. But he, God darn it, he handed Donald Trump a reason to bash the FBI. When he held those press conferences, and forgot that he was the FBI director and thought he was the deputy attorney general because he had been there. He had also been the US attorney in the Southern District of New York. He thought he was a prosecutor. So he holds a press conference to announce no reasonable prosecutor would ever prosecute Hillary Clinton for this set of facts. I'm sorry, are you, are you the attorney general? <laughs> You know, I can tell you the phones were burning up with my former FBI colleagues calling me during the press conference. Oh my God, what did he just say? Don't, don't forget who you are. So, um, yes, I was terribly disappointed, even depressed after the Horowitz uh, finding. But I will tell you, you know, what John, when John Durham came in, because Bill Barr made him, because Bill Barr didn't buy his own inspector general's characterization of the, the Russia case being properly predicated. <clears throat> if you read through John Durham's findings, you'll see his main beef really with that Russia case, when he says, I don't think it was properly predicated. Well, then when you start asking him about that, he'll say, well, <clears throat> it was properly predicated as a preliminary inquiry, but they opened a full. Okay, did they do anything under the full investigation that they could not have done under the PI? Well, no. Okay, so there's no harm, no foul. You, you agree they should have opened a case. You're just arguing about whether it should have been a full or a PI. Yeah. Okay, that, that's what you did for how many, five years? How many years? I don't know. Four, four and a half four years. Four and a half years you found that. And, you, and you, you found an attorney, Klein Smith, who got trapped trying to characterize a CIA source. Okay. And he had uh, acquittals. Yeah. The two or three acquittals. Yeah, there are juries who, he tried people and juries went, no. So, okay, look, 
There is no excuse for the FBI screwing up a FISA affidavit or lying in a FISA affidavit and failing to follow their own rules. That's what kills me sometimes is, you know, there's something called the Woods procedures I know you're very familiar with, where before an FBI agent goes to court, to FISA court, now boy, I, I think I've been to FISA court probably 18 to 20 times in my career. Line by line, there are lawyers at the field level and at headquarters going over literally every line and asking you, show me the, show, you know, show me the money. Where, where's the evidence that this is true, this sentence right here? Where is it? And if they screw that up and lawyer just goes, okay, he said it was true. Oh boy, big problem. So no excuse. The FBI can deprive you of your civil liberties, arrest you, confine you, wiretap you with court orders, they better get it right. And we've got to hold them to account when they, when they don't. More questions? Sir. As a former prosecutor and today as a devil's advocate, I understand the need for red lines. But getting back to that honor killing case, let's say they were part of a sleeper cell planning a 9-11 scale uh, devastation, wouldn't there be a question of maybe bending no. the thoughts there no. about the prosecution? So I, I, hear, I hear you. Good news, this cell was not about that, but, <laughs> but it was more of financing and, and that kind of thing, and courier of messages. Um, if indeed it was like a 9-11 type cell, you would probably go for a disruption. You would probably just disrupt. You, you would say, we know who you are, we know why you're here, and we're, we're deporting you. Um, something like that. Um, but I, I honestly don't think, you know, we're, we're talking about damage control, right? Can you imagine, you know, the public getting wind of the fact that this young teenage girl was murdered and somehow the FBI had it on tape and let it, let it go or covered it up or got creative with it. Um, there was probably some creative solutions here. Um, you could tell the police, you know, I can't tell you why, but, you know, and they, and they, they would say, how do we prosecute? You want us to prosecute a murder case? And we have no evidence. We have, we have a dead body, perhaps, maybe dig it up in the backyard. But we've got nothing. How do you know this, FBI? Well, we, we can't tell you. Really tough. It's really tough. The good news is they were not a, an operational <coughs> violence cell. Yeah. No. You ended your talk uh, by saying, when you have to deal with difficult situations you haven't encountered in the past, you should just rely on the rule of law. Uh, and, 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 you know, all of what got you this far in terms of your, your internal ethics and integrity. Right. Yeah. But right now we have a threat to democracy yep. where the person who's third in line to the presidency um, tried to overturn the 2020 election. So how does the rule of law help you under those circumstances? Yeah, I, I think, so great, a great question because I, I wrestle with this all the time. And a couple of thoughts. First, we need to double down harder on those of us, the majority of the country, by the way, that are all about preserving democracy. And we need not to shrink back and say, uh, I'm sure the institutions will save us, or these people won't prevail ultimately, but rather we have to realize we're in that fight for, for what got us here, democracy and the rule of law. So, you know, it sounds trite, but we gotta turn out and vote for democracy, for democracy. We've got to staff election offices and school boards. We've got to show up at the PTA meetings, right? Because the people who are not with democracy, they're showing up. They're showing up. The Proud Boys are putting on the suit and tie and running for school board. They are. You know, if you wonder what happened to the violent beatings every weekend in certain cities where the Proud Boys would just accost people on the streets, yeah, they've died down because they've gone local, and they've gone to the school board and they've elected and they're, they're volunteering for election precincts, volunteers. So we, we gotta do that. So, so by sticking with the rule of law, the, const the, the constitution, I mean, we gotta step up the fight um, and protect and preserve it 
and not pay, some people tell me, you know, well, you know, we're probably gonna have some kind of democracy, but when, when, they're done, when these guys are done with it, it's gonna look a little different, um, and it's gonna be more authoritarian, and we'll probably have a, a more uh, strong executive president. Yeah, I guess that's what's gonna happen. No. <laughs> so you, you, can, you can have that attitude, but why don't you stick with what got us here? Sir. I got a two-part question. As a, as a journalist and as an author and as a consultant, uh, uh, I'm fascinated by, by AI, chat GPT. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious to what you think about that and the role it's going to play in those things. And, and just to drive home the point, because uh, I have to. I asked Chat for uh, a good question to ask Frank. Oh boy! And and, and based on th this book, and and this is the question. It, it says in your book you discuss the intersection of ethics and national security. How can individuals and institutions strike the right balance between protecting, sort of like what he was asking, between national interests and upholding ethical principles in the context of modern security challenges? So that. The robot came up with that question. I think it's a pretty good question. So, wow. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Can I mention, I don't like chat GPT. <laughs> and that's the free version. I don't like it. No. Um, I, I think we too often view the job of national, of securing the nation, as almost mutually exclusive with the job of preserving civil liberties. And I think that's a wrong approach. I think you can chew gum and walk at the same time. I think you can preserve civil liberties and secure the nation. I think it's a lot harder to do it that way. So, you know, the easy way out is China and Russia. They don't care about civil liberties. And they have a very easy job of controlling their nation. Occasionally there's an uprising and they put it down. Occasionally the Uyghurs are a problem and they put them in camps and retrain them. Right? We don't do that here. We have to worry about civil liberties. And I, I do worry about losing that balance. Um, but we, we have done it. We can do it. Uh, the, the ethics that disturbs me is that you should be allowed to do anything if it comes to protecting national security. That's a problem. Um, yeah, I mean, with, with torture. I mean, that was, that was a... But we didn't know oh, we didn't get into my lovely trip to Guantanamo Bay. Yes. Yeah, when, at, a, at a point in my career, I was at again the number two guy in Miami for a while, and, and Miami had had authority over Guantanamo Bay. Boy, this is how I get the Gitmo story in real quick. So, um, real fast, early days of, Gu of Guantanamo detainees there. Miami agents, CIA, FBI, all, everybody's there. And bad things are happening in interrogation rooms, bad things. One day, pretty early in this, I have my best counterterrorism agents and the Al-Qaeda supervisor for Miami walk into my office and close the door. So I know this isn't going to be good. And they go, hey, um, we have to talk to you. We're, our, our agents are walking out of interrogations. I go, what, what's going on? If we're down there, they, they say to me, if we're down there because President Bush is trying to figure out whether to prosecute these folks in criminal court or whether to do it in military tribunals, we're here to tell you nothing we're getting out of these people can be used in US courts. It's all coerced. OK. And they proceed to describe what's going on, right, and why they're walking out. We wrote it up. You know, this is where the ethics comes in, and staying in your lane and knowing what to do, doing the right thing, even when it's painful, because now here comes the entire intelligence community screaming uh, at the FBI. But we wrote it up, and we sent it to Washington. And, and uh, God bless uh, the director, uh, who was Mueller. He goes, we're not sending anybody there anymore. <laughs> Stop. Then he goes to Justice and the White House, and he goes, we got a problem. Because we cannot torture these detainees and think we're using their stuff in, in court, so we're out. And, and President Bush, that's when President Bush put the FBI in charge of the interrogations. And CIA was livid, livid. But we stuck up, there's your ethics, civil liberties, national security, 
you can, you can do both at the same time. And now, forevermore, the FBI is in charge of the hosting, host, high, high value inter, uh, interrogation group, HIG. Yeah, it's led by the FBI. I guess, um, from my perspective, all this talk about um, the diminution of the rule of law is does not recognize that, for the longest time, the rule of law was not followed for certain groups in this country. Reconstruction, racialized violence, that can that went from the Civil War and continued to this day, okay? It also feeds into the, you were talking about why are these lawyers doing these things that they're doing? Because they believe that the rule of law only applies to certain people. They are above it. Other people, the law has to be followed. Okay, and there's very much an, a racial undercurrent to it. You saw it when Giuliani was quote unquote testifying about those two um, election workers in Georgia um, passing um, these um, oh, yeah. things among them like yeah. crack vials. That's right. I'm like, excuse me, yeah. it's a very much a racial undercurrent to yeah. all of this. Make America great again. Make America when certain people had no rights that other people had to follow, Indeed. had to respect. Indeed. So yes, it's very much a racial and some, to a certain extent, a, extent, a class yeah. undercurrent yeah. to all of this. And this, you know, this hasn't happened in this country, the insurrection, it's happened, yes. okay? Reconstruction, after Reconstruction. The rule of law in the South in certain northern cities. The racialized violence. I mean, this has gone on for a long time, and it needs to be recognized that this is not new. An excellent reminder that we're not looking at an unprecedented it's scenario not unprecedented. here. And you know, the, so you, you, know, you reminded me the, the, you know, we talked a little bit about, oh, the lawyers are doing this. How come the categories or buckets I put them into? The short answer that you remind me of, why are they doing this, these lawyers around Trump? Because they can. Because they can. And no one stops them. Because of their proximity to power, the color of their skin, and, and money. There's a serious socioeconomic yeah, factor nice. here as well. So if you look at the abuses of J. Edgar Hoover in the earlier days of the FBI, well, not that so early the 60s and 70s, horrific things that now are, make it quite clear that he, he was motivated not only by a desire to protect the nation, but there's racist motivation Absolutely. there. I mean, what he did Fred with Mar Hampton. Martin Luther King, Fred Hampton, the Black Panthers, I mean, right, you know, a letter written to Martin Luther King essentially telling him that the only way out was for him to kill himself. Yeah. Um, the setup of, of Fred Hampton, the, you know, essentially the, what I believe to be, this is not an FBI position, by the way, this is my position, but, but the setup of, of a murder of a, a Black Panther leader um, by, by what, what looks like Chicago PD at, at the, with the support of the FBI. Yeah, um, would that have happened to a, a white group? Well, we had domestic white groups, didn't we? We had the Weathermen and the SDS, although they were, they were, they were intermingled. But we weren't murdering them secretly. We, we weren't doing that. So yeah, um, and, and history repeats itself absolutely. As it says in front of the National Archives, the past is prologue. And we've got to keep reminding ourselves of the abuses that can occur. Yeah, thank you. All right, well, Time for one more question if someone has something quick. Sir. Sure. I can answer kind of two, but uh, one, the first one was <laughs> Jenna Ellis mm. and, and your thoughts on 
you know, what, how she said re lately, oh, if I had known now, if I knew then what I knew now, what was it that she knew that she's ne learned now that she didn't know then? Right. What facts have changed? And, and, and the second apropos of, of Comey. <laughs> if, I, 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 if I can interrupt. Yeah, what she knows now is she's looking at prison. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. She's not looking at prison. Well, she's not looking at prison no, in Georgia. Not anymore. Yeah. yeah. But I was curious about your comments on, on that speech and what, what that meant. And second, Comey's um, original statement, you know, uh, announcing the, the fact that they were going to have an investigation, which was so clearly contrary to, as I understand it, to the FBI's position was not unless there's an indictment do we talk about investigations. So was, Absolutely. Yeah. Je Jenna Ellis, look, I, yeah, I, I, I don't mean to kind of find humor in her plight, but um, it's self-inflicted with her. Uh, she did start out as, as a true believer. You know, um, in her speech there in court, crying uh, in her guilty plea, she started out, I think her first sentence was something like, as a Christian and a lawyer. Um, I think that's a genuine devoutness, but the problem is um, when we have faith, I'm all, I'm all about faith and values, if you haven't gotten that, um, but I, when, when, when faith causes you to believe that you've got the only answer, the only answer to politics and government, and there's nothing else that you want to hear about, and therefore uh, God is telling me that I've been placed here and singularly to get this job done and save the society, problem. This is where we, we get into problems. Um, and I'm hearing something similar from the new speaker, by the way. But, um, your, your second part of, of, oh, Comey. So similar issues uh, with Comey in terms of a, a sense uh, and a mindset that sometimes he's the only person in the room who can get it right. He didn't want, you know, his, his story is he didn't want the attorney general at the time to have to make this really hard decision. He would do it for her. And so, yes, he got out of his lane. The FBI investigates and gives it to DOJ to prosecute. It's really pretty simple. We don't make the call on prosecutions, but he wanted to make that call, and he did. And then, of course, he had to reverse himself when they found emails on Tony Anthony Weiner's laptop, right? And then it, right on the eve of the election, famously, he goes, never mind. Uh, the, we already saw those emails previously. Don't, don't worry about it. You know, and if, if you hear Hillary Clinton interviewed on this topic, she pulls no punches about uh, Comey cost her the election. What's the point? Good intentions, I believe, in Comey. Nothing but good intentions. Forgot who he was. Forgot uh, he didn't have clarity about what his mission was and what the values of the organization were. Fascinating conversation. I'm so glad you got that Guantanamo story in. Thank you. Um, and I hope that we can, can talk more about that. And, and, and Frank, the values that you identify are so incredibly important and so core to Searle's mission. Mm -hmm. And so uh, this, is, this is such a perfect book and such a perfect wow. conversation for us to have here at Searle. So um, thank you for staying and signing some books and, and having a glass of wine with us. And please join me, everyone, uh, in thanking you. Oh, thank you. Thank you.